Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Tsuhu. Before we go straight into today's case, I do want to give a content warning that in this video I do talk about sexual assault, so if that's not something that you're interested in hearing, then I don't think that this video is for you, but you can watch some of my other videos or just wait for my next upload. On the 3rd of January 2012, a police officer walked into a home in Mudimule. As soon as he walked into the house, he saw a table and on the table there was a gun and next to the gun was a picture of Yohan Kotsa as well as his wife Ina on their wedding day. On the photo, he had written down, love is like war. Easy to start, difficult to end, impossible to forget. Upstairs, he found Ina cradling her 19-year-old son, Conrad, and Johan Gotza was nowhere to be found. Johannes Christian Gotza was born in Namibia in 1961. His parents were unwed, and because this was the 1960s, having a child out of wedlock was extremely frowned upon. So as soon as his mother gave birth to him, she abandoned him. After this, um, Johan was adopted by a neighbor, but unfortunately, when he was just three months old, this neighbor passed away. His father then got custody of him, and not too long after that, his father did get married to another woman, and they had two daughters. And it said that Johan was very like, close with his sister, they had a really tight-knit relationship, but his stepsisters did say that in high school, Johan was bullied a lot and called names. Lavina Swanapu, who calls herself Ina, and that's how I'll be referring to her um, in the rest of this video, was born in Rustenburg, Northwest, in 1960. 69. She was born in a farming community and had two brothers. Growing up, she wanted to be a secretary in the city and eventually this dream of hers became true because she started working at Home Affairs in Johannesburg. But after a couple of months, she realized that she really hated it and she moved back home to Rustenburg. At 21, she met and married a man, and they were really happy and in love. They had two children, a son who they named Conrad, and a daughter who they named Angelique. But unfortunately, in 2004, Angelique um, saw that her father was having an affair, so she decided to tell her mother, and then the two got a divorce. The children spent most of their time with their mother, but they would occasionally go visit their father. Following her her divorce, Ina became a very successful woman in insurance and even had her own portfolio. Ina met Yuan in 2009 online. I'm not too sure which social media platform they met on, but they did meet online and they spoke for a couple of weeks before deciding that they should like actually meet up in person. Ina decided that they should meet at a garage called Engine. I'm sure just so that she could be around people just in case this person wasn't who he said he was. But they did meet up and I'm assuming Ina had like really good impression of him because after this they went to her house and then they started their relationship. Yuan lived about six hours away but every weekend he made sure that he would go to Mudimule to go visit Ina and her friends really loved him, she liked him, he was very successful, he bought her expensive gifts and their relationship just seemed really happy but things didn't last that long because soon Yohan started showing his true colors. Yohan first told Ina that he liked her with short hair and said that she should cut her hair but Ina just really wasn't for that she didn't want to cut her hair but after a couple of months and like constant comments from Yohan Ina eventually did decide to cut her hair. There were also some times where um, when Yohan and Ina weren't together, he would ask her to send like pictures of her breasts and she would say no, but he was so persistent that she finally did. And after this, he just sent nudes of himself, like unsolicited nudes of himself. 
Yohan wanted to know everyone in Ina's life, from friends, family to co-workers. And maybe he wanted to know her co-workers because just eight months after they got together, he organized with her co-workers for them to plan a fake function so that Ina would go to it and there he proposed to her. She said yes and then on the 23rd of October 2010, the pair tied the knot. Their wedding was great and the couple seemed happy and in love, but the problem started their wedding night, where as soon as they got to their room, Yohan told Ina to sit down and told her that as long as she followed the following rules, they would have a happy and long marriage. So the rules were, she would no longer see anyone without his permission, her parents had to make an appointment to come and visit, and she had to ask permission from him to go and see her own parents. Her children would no longer answer to her, and if they wanted to do something, they needed his permission. He also said that he wanted Ina to put on some weight because she looked sick, and said all of her clothes would be chosen by him. She had to wear clothes with cleavage to show off her boobs, and she had to start wearing black jeans because that's what he preferred. He also said that she had to map out her work days from beginning to end. So when she had client meetings, went to lunch, like just every little tiny detail in between because he just wanted to know every single thing. And Ina was so shocked because like yes um before they got married some things were a bit hmm, like you know off but like now he did a complete 180. the couple then moved in together and yohan sold every single item that ina owned including appliances and his reason was for this was he said that they were starting like a life together and he wanted everything in their house to be theirs and not just and not just hers and also this is when like Yohan started being like a bit weird he wouldn't tell Ina things like when his phone would ring he would go answer his phone outside and it was very weird because he wanted to know every single detail um, about Ina's life but he barely shared any detail about his life or what was going on there was one day where he wasn't with Ina and he called her and he said that his life insurance was denied and this is because he had leukemia. And because Ina was already feeling like, okay, this man um, isn't being honest with me, she was very suspicious of him so she decided to do her own research and this is when she found out that Yuan was lying and he was faking his cancer and for Ina this was just terrible like how could you lie about you having cancer and that was just like the worst type of dishonesty you could like ever have and after this she decided to move out and this was only five months into their marriage and for the next five months after this Yuan was literally like pleading with Ina trying to get her back so they could like continue with their marriage and eventually he did convince her to like I don't know, like, continue their marriage again. And after this, Ina moved in with Yuan, and she moved in with her daughter, Angelique. And they just tried their marriage again for the second time. And things were going relatively good until um, the 11th of July, when Yuan, to celebrate him and Ina's reconciliation, um, decided to send Ina and Angelique to her parents' house. And as soon as she came back, like, everything was gone in the house there was no furniture there was nothing like the house was completely bare and she was so upset and she demanded to know what was going on so as soon as she started like to demand what was going on she sent angelique to her room i'm just assuming because she didn't want angelique to see her and yuan have like um an argument and yuan didn't like this so he went straight to angelique's room and he was like knocking on the door trying to break it down and ina got really upset with him so she slapped him and then her and angelique packed up their stuff and that night they slept um in one of the dorm rooms of a local school and after this her and her children got an apartment and ina remembers like 
going into this apartment and this apartment had nothing but she was so happy because she's like i'm finally away from this man like i'm not going back and i could stay in this apartment that has nothing forever but as long as yohan is not here this is the happiest i could ever be the day after um ina slapped yohan he went to the police station and he opened up um a restraining order against her and Ina was more than happy to comply but even though Yuan was the one to like go to the police station to have this restraining order against Ina or protection order he was the one that didn't follow it he basically started stalking Ina would follow her like everywhere she went would constantly call her show up to her house <sighs> Between July 2011 and January 2012, which is about six months, Yuan called Ina over 150 times and sent her messages over 180 times. Her parents never really liked him as well. And there was one time during like the six month period where Yuan basically beat up Ina's father so badly that her father ended up in the emergency room and the next day true to what Tiwan likes doing um he filed a case of assault against Ina's father and he bribed a witness to say that um Ina's father was the one that hit him first and he was basically just defending himself in November 2011, Yohan went to Ina's house unannounced and told her that he was renting a house from a friend and this house was going to be the most talked about house in Mudimole. But apparently, which is so suspicious, um, he went to his friend and told his friend that he wants to rent that specific house and the friend told him that he can't because there are already tenants in the house. And literally less than 24 hours later, the friend called Yuan and was like, um, they just decided to like cancel their lease randomly. So like the house is yours. There's like no proof that Yuan did anything to like make them leave. But it is a bit suspicious that he was like, I'm going to rent this house. And literally like 24 hours later, the house is available. So Christmas rolled around and Yuan tried to make Ina feel bad for not spending Christmas with him, but Ina already had plans. So Ina spent Christmas with her son Conrad as well as Co one of Conrad's friends and his father. So I'm not too sure where they spent their Christmas, but I think they went to a resort for like Christmas lunch or something like that. And afterwards they went to the friend's house. And um, Yuan says that that night Ina and the friend's father had relations and this basically just like took him over the edge but um ina says nothing happened that night and even if something happened like her and yuan weren't together so he literally has no right to be upset and that basically just means like he was stalking them on christmas because how would you know um like where they went and things like that it's just a bit at this point, Ina had been trying to finalize her divorce from Yuan and just trying to get him to sign the papers. So on the 3rd of January 2012, um, Yuan finally called Ina and said that she should come over because he just wanted to speak about some things. And Ina was really excited because, you know, it was a new year and she thought that, okay, this man is finally going to sign his papers, this divorce can be finalized and I can start the year off like on a good note, you know. So Yohan wanted to meet that day um, around 10 a.m. But Ina said that she couldn't, she had to do some things at the office, but that she could meet him around half past two in the afternoon and Yohan said that this was okay. After this, um, Yuan went to um, a garage that was nearby where he stayed and he picked up three men. He picked up Andri Sitole, Peter Mutaka, and Franz Mpaka. He had prearranged with Andris, who then um, spoke to two other people that he knew. The three men were from Hammanskral and they were brought to the garage by a taxi driver. And once Yuan got to the garage, he went to the taxi driver, paid the guy and thanked him for like bringing them to Mudimole. And then afterwards they got into the car. 
Yuan took them to a shop and then he bought them food and then the guys ate their food under a tree they got into the car and after this they went to Pip and once they got to Pip they bought um three pantyhose and it's not too sure which one of the three men bought the pantyhose but three pantyhose were bought so now i'm going to be telling you the story from ina's perspective so ina says the day of the 3rd of january she got to yuan's house around half past two like she said she would and as soon as she got to the house yuan was like very calm and like nothing seemed odd afterwards he showed her outside they sat um on a table at a table outside and Ina felt like the conversation wasn't going anywhere and she just started getting really frustrated so she wanted to leave and like as she was trying to leave Yoan stopped her and told her that he had a box of her stuff in his bedroom and for a moment Ina was confused because she had never been to the house that um Yuan was currently staying at but she also just wanted to leave so she was just like okay so they went into the house and Yuan showed her like to the bedroom um so she walked into the bedroom and Yuan followed her and after this Yuan went to the bed and on the bed there was um a towel and the towel had some coins on it so he picked up the towel threw some coins and then covered Ina's face with the towel Ina remembers as soon as the towel was taken off of her face, there were three men standing in front of her with pantyhose over their faces. Yohan would give the three men instructions in Afrikaans and then Andris would translate it for the two other men. So I'm not too sure whether they were speaking English. I, I doubt it was English. So I'm sure it was just like another vernacular language like Tswana or like Zulu something like that um so Ina remembers that all four of the men participated in this where they tied her hands behind her head and then they took masking tape and Andres tried to break a small piece of masking tape off but he couldn't so he got really frustrated so he just took the whole roll and started wrapping it around her face like her mouth and it covered her mouth and her nose and she had like a little space where like she could breathe. Yuan told Ina that she was going to be gang raped and that she should prepare herself. After this he told her that she had cheated on him and these were like the repercussions of her having cheated on him and Ina just started shaking her head violently trying to say no. After this Yuan would constantly make comments to her saying that when he's with a woman and like they leave her it, and they leave him sorry it's either they end up killing themselves or they end up in a mental institution. Ina remembers when her and Yuan first started getting to know each other um Yuan had asked her what her greatest fear is what her biggest fear is and Ina said it was being gag raped so now I'm going to go into detail about what happened to Ina that day um and it is pretty gruesome so if you don't want to hear all those details I'll put a time stamp like down below um, where you can like skip to Yuan told the men to undress her and then they pulled her shirt open to show her breasts. They took pliers and twisted her left nipple and ripped it off. They then inserted a nail into her right breast and squeezed it until blood came out. Then they took scissors and cut off chunks of her hair. Then pushed pliers into her anus and inserted a metal object that was about 25 centimeters into her vagina. They then threw a bucket of ice cold water over her and then Yuan told the men to begin the rape. Andres began followed by Peter and then Franz. As this was happening Yuan called his daughter from a previous relationship and um, they were basically just talking about her upcoming visit um, to Mudumule to go like see her dad and it's just so crazy how all of this is happening and Yuan can like pick up the phone and call his daughter and just act like nothing is going on. Lastly, Yuan poured chloride over Ina's breasts and her genitals. The chloride he used is usually used for livestock to stop blood and the normal dosage is one to two drops because it's really strong and it stings and Yuan used the whole bottle. 
After this, he told Ina, he took Ina's phone and told her that he was going to call her son Conrad and lure him to the house and give him the ultimatum of either um, raping his mother um, or he was going to kill him. And after this, Yohan called Conrad. Conrad was at the gym at this time. He answered the phone. Um, and after this, he went straight to the house to meet Yohan because Yohan said that him and Ina had to talk to him about something. Conrad arrived on his motorcycle with a friend and it's believed he came with a friend because it was said that Conrad was scared of Yohan and he really just didn't like him. So as soon as they got to the house, Yohan said that he needed help moving a couple of things. So he told the friend to go to the garage and get a crate. Afterwards, he told Conrad that his mom was in the house and he could go inside if he wanted to see her. And Ina remembers hearing her son walk into the house and just say, please don't three times. And then she heard three consecutive gunshots and then silence. It's not determined when the three other men left, whether it was before Conrad arrived or um, after Yohan had shot him, but Yohan and the three men had left. And as Yohan was leaving the house, he called the guy that he was renting from, but he didn't answer. He then decided to call the guy's wife and told her um, that something happened in the house and she has to come, like she would just come check it out. So she immediately went to the house and when she got there she found Conrad's friend just waiting downstairs and the reason why he was waiting was because as soon as he got to the crate he went into the house and he saw no one he assumed they were all upstairs and maybe like um, a family situation was going on so he didn't want to disturb them and he hadn't heard any of the gunshots so the lady arrived and she sees the friend she walks upstairs and she finds Conrad's body um, lying in the hallway I'm um, just a couple of meters away from the main bedroom and he was already deceased. When they got to the main bedroom, they cut Ina loose and then she ran out and started cradling her 19-year-old son, Conrad. Instead of going to a hospital, Ina went to a general practitioner. I'm assuming just because she just didn't want to go to a hospital. But the problem with this is that um, GPs... Um, aren't really that trained to write down what happens in a sexual assault case so all the notes that he had taken down weren't written accurately as well as the terms and stuff like that so when the police officers asked Ina what had happened to her she said um, there were three other men involved in what had happened to her and then the police officers managed to get a hold of Yuan's cell phone records and in his cell phone records they saw that he had called one number over 40 times in the last two weeks so they look at this number they and they were able to trace it back to Andrew Sotole and they arrested him and not long after that he said the other two men's names and they too were arrested so the media and the community believed that maybe these three men were forced by Yuan to rape Ina um, because it's believed that Yuan picked them up to like just do some gardening work, you know, some manual labor in the house. But it was found out that that wasn't true. So a couple of days after what had happened to Ina, these men went to the police station and they basically wanted to open up a case against Yuan for having not paid them for their day's work on the 3rd of January. Yeah, you heard right. And then the police officers told them that no, they have to go to the small claims court to go open up a case against Yuan for having not paid them. And literally the next day, they went to the small claims court and they opened up a case against Yuan for having not paid them for raping and torturing Ina. The search began for Yohan and eight days later he was spotted at a garage by a lady and immediately this lady called the police and I'm assuming Yohan saw what was going on and he knew that he had been spotted and he immediately left. So the police officers got there probably like less than 10 minutes after this phone call but Yohan was already gone. And because he was in such a rush to get out of that place, he crashed his car into a tree and now he was on foot. And a couple of hours later, he went to his friend's dentist practice 
And as soon as the friend saw him, he knew that he had to keep him there until the police arrived. And he once started speaking to him and told him that, no, he just, like, he wanted to speak to him about some things. He needed some advice. And the friend said, okay, that's no problem. Let me go make us some coffee um, and we can speak about it. So as soon as he got out of the room, he called the police. And within 10 minutes, Yuan Kotsa was arrested. They discovered that Yuan had been living in the bushes. And in these bushes, he had a gas stove. He had a blanket as well as a pile of letters. He had been writing letters ever since the 3rd of January. Um, and these letters were addressed to Ina. And in one of these letters, he blamed Ina for what had happened to her, saying that she had cheated on him. And basically, she brought it upon herself. Yohan Kotsa, Andri Sitole, Franz Mpaka, and Peter Motlaka were charged with one count of murder, one count of attempted murder, kidnapping, and rape. During the trial, it was discovered that Ina and Conrad were not Yohan's first victims. So in the 1990s, after Yohan had left Namibia, he moved to the Northern Cape to a little city called Priska. And somehow he managed to like wriggle his way into the sheriff's office and he was just in charge of some things. So there was this one case where he went to this guy's house to try and arrest him but when he got there the guy had already ran away but his sister was home and he was questioning this woman and apparently during this questioning she went to the bathroom outside and as she was walking Yuan shot her and she went to Kimberley Hospital and a couple of days later she unfortunately passed away. He was found guilty but I think he only went to prison for a couple of months if like not or like something less or less than that. It was like a ridiculous sentence so or he was acquitted of it I'm not sure. I'm not sure but after Yuan was um arrested for what had happened to Ina and the people in Priska saw all of these things on the news. They um, made a petition for Yuan to be re-sentenced or recharged with um, this woman's murder. Sarita Fenta is another woman that Yuan Kotsa was involved with. They dated for a couple of months and when they met, uh, Sarita wasn't doing too well in terms of health and she was lonely. So she met this man and he was like this like knight in shining armor. He was coming to save her, take her to a doctor's appointment. And not too long after they started dating, she was diagnosed with a cancerous brain tumor. And throughout their relationship, Yuan was basically just a terrible person. He would make fun of her for the fact that she had to have an oxygen mask with her probably 24 hours a day. He would take care of all her finances. By the time their relationship ended, um, Yuan owed, owed, owed Sarita over 1 million rand. And it said that during the whole entire relationship, um, they didn't sleep together. So it is believed that Yuan was just with her for financial gain. And unfortunately, um, just a month after Ina and Yuan got married, Sarita was found with a bottle of pills around her and it is believed that she did commit suicide. But one of her sons do you believe that Yuan did murder Sarita and that he made it look like a suicide? It was also discovered that after Sarita found out that Yuan and Ina were dating, she got a hold of Ina and tried to warn her about Yuan. Um, but Yuan basically just told Ina that this was an ex-girlfriend that couldn't get over him and that she shouldn't believe him. And Ina took Yuan's word for it. And it was also discovered that another lady also had a similar story to Sarita in terms of finding out about Ina, calling Ina and trying to warn her about Yuan. Yuan tried the insanity plea, but he was taken for an assessment and it was discovered that he was fit to stand trial. Whilst Ina was on the stand during her cross-examination, the defense attorney was literally just a terrible person. He kept saying that Ina was lying because remember she went to a GP instead of a hospital um, and 
as she was on the stand talking about like all the injuries that she had sustained they were looking at the gp's report and some of the things weren't there so he kept saying that ina was a liar and then he also said that so basically ina had gotten a breast augmentation and as he was doing the cross-examination he basically said to ina that you know what Yohan was right for damaging the breasts that he paid for. During the trial, there were also Facebook groups in support of Yohan. And these Facebook groups um, mostly had women in them who supported Yohan and what he had done. And uh, like while he was in prison for the trial, he also received lots and lots of fan mail. Fan mail. There was so much attention on Yuan that people literally forgot about the other three men who were involved in the case. But throughout the trial, the men kept saying that they were forced to rape Ina and they did everything they did under duress. And the two men, Peter and Motlaka, they kind of like allied, they were like together and also kept saying that Andres and Yuan were working together and they knew each other well. And even after the whole ordeal that happened with Ina in the bedroom, once they were out of the bedroom and they asked Andres what was happening now, he said, no, um, he is going, he's calling her son because he wants to hurt him as well. So they kind of had like their two man pack against Andres and Yuan. Two years after the trial began, on the 17th of July, 2013, Yohan Kotza, the so-called Mudimule monster, was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Conrad Bonetta, the rape of his ex-wife Ina Bonetta, and for kidnapping and assault. His three co-accused, Andri Sitole, Franz Mpaka, and Peter Motlaka, have all been given life sentences. Andri Sitole was found guilty on all the same charges as Yohan Kotza, whereas Franz Mpaka and Peter Motlaka were acquitted of murder charges, but found guilty for kidnapping and rape. For assault with intent to do grievously body harm, Yuan Kotza received 15 years and the other three men 8 years each. Ina went on to write a book called A Feral van Genada and Genissen, which is a tale of mercy and healing, where she just describes her encounter and what happened to her that day. It is in Afrikaans, as you can tell by the title, but I'll put... Um, links in the description box where you can buy it if you do want to read the book. And that's it for today's case. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you have any comments, please leave them down below and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!